Hello, and welcome to the Natural Selection Podcast, the conservation podcast brought to you by the University of Exeter Biosciences Master Students. Your host for this episode is Deborah Kornblatt. Today, we will be talking about a bird that likes to keep an eye on your chips, the herring gull. Madeline Gumas, a PhD student on the Cornwall campus of the University of Exeter, will tell us all about it. Thank you for joining us today, Madeline. Thank you for having me. So we're here to talk about your study that you recently released about how seagulls favor food that humans have handled. But before that, could you please introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, I'm Madeline. I'm a PhD student at the University of Exeter's Penryn campus. My supervisors here are Neltra Bohert and Laura Kelly. I started off as a master's student, doing a master's by research and converted to a PhD earlier this year after graduating with a degree in zoology in 2018. That's great. So the study you've recently released is all about how gulls choose food. For our listeners, could you summarize what your study found? I wondered, um, having observed gull behavior, whether they are more likely to approach and peck at objects that they've seen a human handling, because people probably thought this might be something they do, because obviously they're interacting with humans on a regular basis, um, humans do leave a lot of food out for goals, whether they mean to do it or not. They leave a lot of litter and food crumbs and it seemed likely that goals would learn to associate humans with food. And so I did this study, I handled, I had two objects that are identical, so there should have been equal chance for them to go to both. But I handled one to see if they were more likely to go to that one. And I found that they were, when it was a food object, they were more likely to go to the handled food object, but not when it wasn't the food object, which implies, I think, that that humans are drawing their attention. And um, and it just, I think the takeaway for that is, I think everyone knows we shouldn't be littering, but it, it implies that if people didn't drop so much food, then girls probably wouldn't be making this association between us and food. And we wouldn't be encouraging them to spend so much time foraging in urban areas when obviously people don't really like that consider that to be a nuisance so something that could potentially be avoided if people are a bit more mindful. If you had to describe your research in one word what would it be Mm -hmm. and this can be the research regarding the seagulls or if it seems that this has been a a topic that's been a trend in some of the past work you've done but in one word what would it be? Um, Well (laughs) that's tricky I mean I could just say seagulls and everyone will obviously no I mean or or staring is something that comes to mind as well because my paper that came out last year uh, all the headlines were about staring at seagulls to stop them eating your chips which I thought was quite funny. So why seagulls? (laughs) What brought you to this topic? Why is it important? Why should people (laughs) care about it? Yeah it's a good question and a lot of people ask that like why would you study seagulls? They're just a nuisance, they're sky rats and you know surely they're not important there are loads of them they're not um, in danger of you know becoming extinct or anything but yeah when actually since moving to Cornwall to start my undergraduate degree um, is when I started getting interested in them because suddenly I was seeing them up close and I found that very interesting that there's a wild animal that you can get close to because a lot of wild animals are kind of really scared of you I started noticing their behavior I just thought they're quite cool actually um actually one thing that got me interested was that um some people from the west cornwall ringing group had ringed a load of gulls and i was seeing all these gulls around town and falmouth and places with blue color rings on with the numbers on and i was reporting them and and then going back and seeing them again like oh these gulls you know they're, they're going back to the same places get to know an individual so i found that quite interesting and i thought maybe i could do something do a project and and study their behavior because they spend so much time around humans and interact with them and obviously a lot of people don't like this and they find that really annoying especially when you hear people getting their food snatched by a gull I thought this is quite um, interesting behavior to study these birds you know they're seabirds but they seem to be doing well in urban areas there are loads of them around but actually their population in in the country as a whole is is decreasing so I thought that was and interesting as well they seem to be doing well in urban areas and I wondered why and like how their behavior might enable them to 
to be successful and where they really are successful. So that's how it all started. So when you started it, did you find that there was a lot of information already out there or did you have to do a lot of the groundwork yourself? There is a lot of information about herring gulls. The particular seagull I study is herring gull, um, which is the ones that you see a lot of around Cornwall. I think people will be very familiar with them. They're the ones that tend to nest on people's roofs here. But there's a lot of research that's been done on them, but it's all been in sort of traditional areas, so places where there are no people around, where they nest, you know, they're not on people's roofs, they're in the in what you might call their natural habitats, which is a bit of a loaded word. So in like on offshore islands and things like that. and I thought it'd be really good to understand a bit more about the goals in urban areas and their interactions with people so there really wasn't a lot on that and there wasn't a lot on wild animals interactions with people and how their behavior is affected so this was a very good thing to sort of get the ball rolling on for sure it's always cool when you can find like a niche or something different that people haven't looked at before that must have been a really exciting feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah it was, it's been quite amazing, actually, because I didn't think people would be very interested in it. But um, I had a paper come out last year and the media just went absolutely crazy about it. And I was like, wow, people are really interested in goals. And I think it's because a lot of people love to hate them. That is fair. <laughs> <laughs> As someone who has definitely had food stolen by a, by a gull, I can yeah. express that it is not an enjoyable experience. But yeah, how has it been managing the media attention then? I I mean, it sounds like you were surprised by that. <laughs> yeah, it's been very interesting. So it's not something that I feel I'm naturally good at, <laughs> like dealing with media requests and being, you know, suddenly on the TV and and radio talking to loads of people. As it was, a bit, it was so sudden, and I just had to get on with it really. So it's just like learning on the job and sort of gradually getting more comfortable <laughs> with it. So yeah, it was definitely um, a learning experience and quite bewildering it's kind of one of those things that it was just such a rush like on the day the paper comes out all the media attention it just seems like everyone just wants to talk to you and you've got so many requests and there's no time to really worry about it and then it's like the next day you're like whoa what just happened as <laughs> scientists generally there a lot of people struggle to even speak up in front of a classroom at least at the master's level and that's why we're here to learn yeah. so were there any big moments of revelation that you had in that process i think the way i did it probably wasn't the best way to do it. I think maybe get trying to get a bit more experience um, in public speaking. So for people doing a degree, they can take opportunities to present work. So obviously um, a lot of people are a bit shy about presenting to people. A good way would be, you know, just make yourself do it. I know it's easier said than done, but if you know you're going to have to do this on a more regular basis, it's good to make just to push yourself out of your comfort zone but obviously you start small it's easier to to start small and um, with smaller groups and you can sort of progress but for me it was a bit like suddenly <laughs> I was talking to the whole nation and it was quite scary and I mean it went fine so it's probably most of the time people are gonna going to find it fine but afterwards a bit I was a bit like oh I, I think I should have said some different things you know that probably didn't come across the way I want it so just to be really prepared so I wasn't I don't think that prepared for it because I didn't expect such a big amount of media attention but just always be prepared with the thing the points you want to get across yeah would you say that the media then represented your research accurately like were you happy with the way that they had depicted it yes and no so the stuff about staring at seagulls a, a lot of uh, headlines were last year if they really made it about the the staring <laughs> instead of <laughs> what i was really studying as do gulls approach you know i had a bag of chips that were sealed because i didn't want to actually feed the gulls but, and really i was asking do they take longer to approach when i'm looking at them versus when i'm looking away because I wanted to see whether they are, whether looking at them does have an effect on their behaviour to slow them down and whether they're finding that what we call aversive, so they don't like being looked at. And I thought the implications of that were that you should be paying attention to your surroundings. If you're going to be eating in areas where there are lots of goals around, don't just be looking down at your food or looking at your phone or whatever, be looking around because they will swoop down places where people can't see them. So if you're, if you're not looking, then there's a, a better chance that you're going to have your food taken. So I was hoping that they would take that out of it. So being more vigilant rather than just singling out a goal and staring at it, because 
obviously other goals might <laughs> come in from behind when you're doing that and, and nab the food while you, you've singled out a different goal. So that was a bit frustrating because I saw people going, oh, how's that, how's that going to work? And I was just like, that's not what we meant. <laughs> what does that actually look like to study goal behavior? Really, what the research looks like is quite different to what people might expect. So that's something I learnt with both my studies on whether goals approach chips when you're looking at them or looking away, or my more recent study of whether they are more likely to peck at objects that a human has handled. In both cases, I found that the majority of goals I approached, they didn't actually come over. They would, uh, most of them would fly away. The ones that did stay, a lot of them, they would, they wouldn't come over. So it seems like they're too nervous. But when you're walking around and you're looking at goals on the beach and how they're interacting with people, you kind of get the impression that they're really bold and that they'll all be like coming over to, to snatch food at any opportunity. But this isn't what we found at all. I thought that was quite interesting that it seems to be a smaller number of goals that are actually bold enough to come over towards me, towards a, a, a human or even in my experiment looking at whether they approached objects that I'd handled and then I'd actually move away. And it just seems a lot of them are actually more nervous than we think, which I think is, is interesting and has implications because if um, we're going to think about managing them, which is, is something that people do at the moment, they um, control goals in some areas because obviously, as I said, people um, don't like them, people don't want to feel like they're at risk of having their food snatched so people do take action against them but if we know that it's a, a small number of individuals then we can do something perhaps a bit more targeted than a more general approach that affects all the goals in the population when most of them wouldn't bother us at all in the first place and obviously there are certain goals from the behavior side you can sort of sometimes see when a goal is interested in in coming over and it's times where they look like they're just not going to participate in the experiment at all and they're very nervous. How do you see the future of this topic and of just goal conservation and human goal and behaviors uh, moving forward? Like what's the next important step that we need to do in order to mitigate these interactions and the negative consequences that can come out of when somebody isn't so happy that their food was taken and might even attack a gull or chase it away. Yeah, so I think public awareness is an important thing in, in, in that respect. Getting the message out there that, well, herring gulls are decreasing in number. I mean, they might look common because if you go to certain places, there seem to be loads around, but overall they are decreasing. So making people aware of that and making people aware from what we found, it suggests that most goals aren't causing these problems that people find so annoying. Um, and that's also very useful, I think, for people to know that it's more likely to be a few very bold individuals and not to just go, oh, goals are just this awful species. So a lot of people really just don't care about them and think, if they were wiped out, that'd be absolutely fine. Obviously, <laughs> obviously, we don't think that as um, biologists, but it's just getting that information out there that they are part of the ecosystem. They're they're na you know they're naturally in these environments, and we really should be living alongside wild animals, not getting rid of all the ones that we don't like, and just trying to to find a way to live alongside them a bit more peacefully. So if we can inform people of how their behaviour might affect goal behavior they might be able to change their behavior so for example if they are more vigilant when they're eating they're probably going to be less likely to have their food take and less likely to be annoyed by goals I mean some people I've seen they seem to find it quite funny and it's fine but some people as you say they get very angry and attack the goal it seems to completely ruin their day if their chip's been taken so it would be good to try, try and get people to be a bit more considerate, I think. And I think that's really great that, you know, you chose gulls as the topic of human wildlife conflict, because I think many people and myself included usually think of human wildlife conflict as something far away <laughs> and something in in like Africa where there are larger mammals that are more emblematic. Yeah, absolutely. And I think people in this country forget that we've wiped out a lot of the animals that we had these conflicts with. So obviously when we're talking about large mammals, then 
<laughs> the sort of conflict we think about is probably a lot more serious than um, that with goals. But I think maybe not having these large animals around or not having that sort of risk to safety and our livestock, I suppose, is the main reason we got rid of our large carnivores. People then can focus on these smaller conflicts and make them actually quite a big thing. And as you say, we tend to think of that as being a problem in other countries, but we've sort of gone past that and wiped out a lot of our animals. And now we're you know, you've got people that would quite like to get rid of more animals that we still have, and that's obviously not the way forward. Is there anything else that you would want a listener of this episode to take away or to know about goal conflict? I, I don't know, actually. Um, I think, yeah, I said it already that it's quite surprising how few goals actually approach when you when you think that they're, they're all going to um, come over and grab the food that you've just put out. Yeah, that's a really great point that you know, as you said, we should really always be aware of our surroundings, whether that's around people or around the wildlife that's next to us. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for taking some time to talk about the research. It's been really interesting. And hopefully we'll get to read more about this study and the coming newspapers. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for tuning in this week. Join us next time when we interview Dr. Emily Duncan, a leading scholar recognized by Forbes as a 30 under 30.